last night that there were a couple that I did not include in here. So Colorado, um, we are a um, state administered county run. So um, the state oversees, there are 64 counties um, as you kind of see there. And the, the division of child wear oversees our welfare practice and provides the policy direction um, and 80% of our funding. Um, currently, there are 654 kids in out-of-home placement in Denver County. Um, and so this is kind of what the ethnic breakdown is. Um, 299 Hispanic, 170 black, 120 white, seven Asian, um, 47 that identifies multiracial, and then 11 that chose the other category. Um, of those 654 kids that are in out-of-home placement, there are 116 youth over the age of 15 um, in care, and of that number, 69 youth with Oplicos. I think most of you use Atla, but we use Opla in um, Colorado. And so, um, in this chart, it shows congregate care in a family-like setting. And so really, uh, in Denver, we had a push for the reduction of con congregate care. And so those numbers reflect um, for just that last term I'll go over, there's about 79.6% of those kids that are in out-of-home care, they're in a family-like setting. And then there is 14.1% that are still in congregate care, so like group home. Uh, we closed a lot of the TRCCS levels of care. We have no PTRCCS in Colorado available, and so um, with the Families First legislation come in, we've really been working hard to get that going and partially use permanency roundtables to push that and finding permanency for youth in Colorado. So, what was the problem? Um, like many of you, that Pico caught me and I had to change it up um, a couple of months into it. Uh, Sharon Lynn, why she calls me the wise one, she is definitely the wise one. And um, it's interesting for her to say how much, you know, I have my data ready because she knows I have a hate-hate relationship with that. <laughs> <laughs> And I continuously tell her that is not my thing. <laughs> but it is a necessary evil. 
And so um, when I first started, um, I was in the weeds and it was too big. I kept making it too big and uh, because there's so many levels and layers to the topic and what I wanted to address. And with me changing positions and being in the position of, for the independent living program manager and running those things, I came at a closer glance of it and I had all of these things and ideas of how to push that for kids. So originally my question was if children ages 14 to 21 who have been in out-of-home placement for a year or longer receive education about and are connected to resources available to support them after they leave the system compared to children who achieve legal permanence without additional education or support, what type of entitlements would you be accessing when leaving the system? Will there be an increase of awareness, knowledge, and intent to access resources available to youth and the families that support them when exiting the foster care system? Mouthful, right? <laughs> Very lofty goals. So kind of tweaked it a little bit to make it smaller and more manageable to if stakeholders, foster parents, kinship providers, caseworkers, judicial partners, and youth receive education about and are connected to resources available to support youth exiting the foster care system compared to stakeholders who do not receive education Will there be an increase of stakeholders' awareness, knowledge, access, and intent to access more of permanency resources available to adolescents ages 14 to 21 exiting the foster care system? So tweaking it a little bit to make it more about um, the education of resources versus the outcomes of legal permanence, um, because of course, we didn't have enough time to get that bad. <laughs> so a little bit about why I chose that as my goal. Um, as I said, uh, prior to this role, um, I was a facilitator, so I facilitated family engagement meetings, but was also um, the lead permanency roundtable worker, so kind of pushed that process in Denver County um, since 2010. And running those meetings, a lot of times would come across the table for youth is they would have to choose between permanency and resources. What do I mean by that? Um, a lot of professionals with all of our knowledge tend to say after a certain age for the youth, oh, you need to stay in care so you can get these entitlements. As opposed to you need a family and be connected to people because that's what's going to support you. So it's not going to matter if you have JP. Um, when you exit the system, if you don't have support and a forever family to belong. <laughs> so, um, right? Um, so from the mouth of babes, um, I, I really the story yesterday from Kim really resonated with me and I also share with her because in facilitating those meetings, um, I recall two years ago when doing a closing permanency roundtable for youth with all of her professionals sitting at the table. She was turning 21. We had to close her case. Um, and she told us, y'all made me homeless. And I was better off with my family who abused um, that like was a gut punch to me and to with, I didn't make it to the bathroom, tears streaming down my face, because she was right. We had failed her and were getting ready to push her out of the door and she had no resources or support. So that stayed with me. I'm typically not able to say it again without getting emotional about it because we get it wrong a lot. And um, so much want the opportunity to get it right. Um, there was another youth that when I was a caseworker and started like 13 years ago, he was one of our legacy kids, um, meaning that he had been in the care of us for 10 years or more. 
um, when asked about like who his emergency contact would be, um, he got very emotional <coughs> and yelled out, a building raised me. I don't have anyone. And so that really drives me on this work and why we must do better. So when I talk about myths of emancipation is my experience in Colorado. There's a lot of myths out there of what people think about for children, our, our teens, right? Uh, when they move and couldn't find adoption and we don't know where for them to go, um, they're like, oh, you're just gonna get an emancipation goal and all of these services are going to magically come. Not thinking of if you have children, you don't tell your 18 year old, you're emancipated now. <laughs> Go forth and be productive, right? Who says that to anyone? But that's the language we speak as social workers. Check the box, that's the track you all now, kid. Good luck to you. You know, call me if you need something, right? And so, um, reviewing the literature, there was a great article about emancipated youth, but statistics tell us that when giving youth an emancipation goal, there are lower rates of high school graduation, a decreased likelihood of obtaining secondary education. So those entitlements that we're fighting for, for them to go to college, they don't go to college, right? Um, higher rates of mental health concerns and an increased risk for homelessness, i.e. we waited down to the last minute and aged them out and closed the door. So um, in this article, it was examining the use of an emancipation checklist to be used in court, and it was designed to provide guidance and accountability for stakeholders, ensure that the youth voice was there in planning, and help youth better prepare for successful emancipation. We did used to, like back in the day, use an emancipation checklist in Denver. We have benchmark hearings um, in Denver that start at age 16 to kind of go through the emancipation checklist. And so on there are things like if they have their vital documents, if they know how to access medical resources, um, if they have mental health in place, who are their emergency contacts, and um, what that looks like for them. And so um, during the benchmark hearing, it's supposed to be more personal, so the judge will come off of the bench and go through the checklist with the youth. Um, so it's supposed to be felt as more informal and really kind of connect with the youth and engage them in that way of yes, do you want this, no, you know, do you know how to do this? And then um, usually the youth GAL um, will buy them a meal, whatever they want. We had a youth that said they wanted Cheesecake Factory, so they bought them Cheesecake Factory to share a meal with the team in judges' chambers. So the kids come to kind of like that experience. And it's a way to kind of engage them and get them involved in court, because how many youth that we have that, you know, they're just like, you guys are gonna do whatever, I'm not coming to court. So um, for my project, what I did is um, to kind of see what information was out there, because um, I recognized there's a need to educate, but before I did that, I wanted to be very thoughtful about how I went through that, um, because emancipation, our teens are not new, and for some reason, we're still not getting it, so I kind of want to know what was out there before I started to develop how to take that apart and dismantle them for them. So I came up with a four-question survey, um, and it was sent out to foster parents, attorneys, judges, probation officers, caseworkers, and youth. I had about 300 surveys that I sent out of that. I got 68 back. And so, Sherilyn is such a little educating peer mom that she's like, that's good, hey, that's good. And I'm like, that's terrible. I was not, it did not dawn on me to bribe them like you that brilliant. <laughs> What did the survey say? 
Um, the first question I had on there was what their role was in working with youth. Um, and as you can kind of see up there, out of the 68 that I had returned, I had one judge, zero oh, attorneys, yeah. though. Oh, zero attorneys. One judge. One judge. <laughs> Yep, give it up for the one judge. And so, um, as you can kind of see, caseworkers, um, 37 caseworkers responded, um, which was great. And then kind of the, uh, I like that 10 foster parents responded. Um, so I kind of thought, okay, that, that's a little good, I guess. I'll take it. So my second question was, as a stakeholder, do you believe it better for a youth to age out of the system or to achieve permanency. And so as you can see, most people said 80% um, to achieve permanency. But it's that 20% that I was worried about that were neutral on it. So they didn't really answer our, our no, which is very indicative of who we have in our workforce and serving our youth. Um, the last question that I had on there was, to the best of your knowledge, which youth populations are eligible for the following services? So I had this grid, and they could answer um, that these services were either for youth reaching permanency only, um, meaning you know adopted, um, APR, those, those routes, or youth aging out only, or both. And so um, it was kind of a little bit all over the place. Uh, but telling that the youth aging out numbers only were pretty high in all of those areas. Hence where those myths come from about what kids that have just been in care can and cannot receive. So what did that mean to me? Um, I guess this was my last question. Um, as a stakeholder, do you feel that you know enough of more information about resources and entitlements available for you transitioning out of the foster care system. And people were honest, and 85% said that they did not know. But that's still that 15% that said that they did. Um, can't even blame it on the attorneys this time because they didn't respond. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was good. So once. Um, getting that information back. Um, it kind of confirmed what I already knew to be true, that more education about what resources are available were needed. And so um, as in my role now, I'm putting together training to educate the masses about um, what CHAPI is, what entitlements are available, and um, plan to get continuous feedback because the turnover I think is part of the problem because like some of the older seasoned workers that have been there are not there anymore and the millennials don't stay and so <laughs> you know by the time you get the information they're like out of here. <laughs> oh, sorry millennials if there's any in the room sorry. Um, and so I want to get continuous feedback, just really checking in with them and, and what people know. And that data collection, so my hate-hate relationship with data, um, but using it in a different way um, to kind of drive the practice because the numbers don't lie and we need to pay attention to them. And so um, <coughs> I am going to revive at my agency because the emancipation checklist, they haven't used it in years, probably since I did case carrying work. Um, so I'm going to revitalize that and bring it back as a tool for not just our workers, but also community partners. And so I will um, train judicial partners, um, meet with CASA and um, our other providers to kind of really educate people on what that is, what they should be looking for every time. I will create a, a one-pager um, just that kind of gives the small glimpse of what it is in one place so people can see to hand out at family engagement meetings for you to have, for workers to use when they're going out on home visits to engage their youth. Um, 
And then I've also created a guide um, in partnership with other facilitators and professionals across our state. We came together um, to put together some of these to dispel the myths. And like I said, it's called the Pathways to Permanent. So it's like a grid that gives adoption, like if you turn return home, APR, it has all of those things. And then it kind of says what youth are available for, because I kind of found that um, in some of those meetings, adoptive parents, for example, that was a barrier for them to for adoption because they were worried about uh, how they would send the kids to college. So being able to hand them literature so they can see what the kids actually can get and they can still go to college because they can still get that Pell Grant. They're still eligible for these things um, if they adopt this youth. Um, in Colorado, there are changes to our vol volume seven rules that are coming that I was super fired about, up about um, is our Chafee age is being extended to 23. You know that's something that's slowly moving across all of the states um, that has not changed just yet in Colorado, but hopefully by 2020, it will be put into practice, um, which I think will be very instrumental from us having not keeping kids in care to get those services because I feel like by the time our kids are about 21, by the time they realize what benefit safety is, and by then they, they can't get any help, so that extension would help. And then they're going to extend the educational training voucher until 26, um, which is that college money that people think that Chafee pays for, because they're like, oh, you need Chafee because they pay for college. And like, Chafee does not pay for college. It connects you to resources that will get you to college. And so um, that's a, a change that's good. Um, in Denver, I really um, have been working on with the permanency roundtables and just in my program, a practice shift. Um, I always start my trainings with begin with permanency in mind because I think like you have intake workers, you have um, people that the child protection workers that are like, oh, I don't work with you. I don't, I don't do that. So it's not necessary for me to engage that. That doesn't belong to me. But the first time you touch the family, our opportunities, our kids are telling you like they're connected to family. We know that they go back to these families and there's information there. And so who the child considers to be family, oh, they're not appropriate, so we ruled them out. And you know, looking at what was a worry at six and what's a worry at 16 does not look the same. So um, really trying to say that over and over again for people to get that, uh, the first time you touch the child, you need to keep that thing in mind and that it's not better for kids to stay in foster care. We do a terrible job raising kids. And so to get in time. <laughs> so um, kind of some of my reflections in, in doing this program, I am thankful for this opportunity. I have really pushed myself um, to limits that I didn't even know that I had to more. Um, I have changed my perspective on data, and now I have a, a love-hate instead of a hate-hate <laughs> with it. Um, but really kind of just changing my mindset on how you use the data um, in the relationship with the data. I always thought that, you know, numbers, people, you can make numbers look like anything, but, you know, I'm an engagement person. I like to engage and, you know, tell me how those numbers happen in real life. Like, that's been my thought process. But then in seeing if you kind of change that and how I present that to people that I could utilize those numbers to help that impact in life. So that was something that um, I was really happy about. And then um, my quote here is stay patient and trust your journey. I think um, like a lot of you, we have so much on your plate and putting this program on my plate at the same time I was taking over the IL program manager position 
And my supervisor thought it would be fun to push me to do the black belt training of like, go, Heather, go. And so I was doing all these things, um, but realized, you know, that is leadership. And I was like, there's a method to my madness. So taking all of that on, it kind of layered up and helped me to see that um, I would be able to use all those tools. And so now I'm ready. And so in listening to all of you over the past couple days, I was feeling like, dang, I didn't really get anything accomplished here because I do feel like I'm at the beginning of my work. Like my work has just started. And that is true. But I have done a lot of the legwork to put the tools in place to get going. And so I'm thankful for this opportunity. I was a bit worried when um, we started this project. And I remember telling you, Sherilyn, the stuff that we need to change about this program. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> it's highly probability. But, <laughs> um, I, I was worried about how data heavy and research oriented the project was um, because in some of it is like over my head, but really am appreciative of that because how else would you learn the leadership qualities that you need to know if you didn't have something you were working on that was tangible and kind of poke your head through it 